As we resume our study of the Westminster Confession of Faith, we address ourselves to the fall of man, sin and punishment thereof. It's appropriate that we should begin our study with a word of prayer. O oh, Father, we do confess that we are the fallen children of Adam, and even in Christ Jesus, redeemed by His mercy, we still have remnants of our original corruption very powerful within us. Help us, therefore, to study our past and understand our present in the light of the first and the second Adam, for we ask it in Christ's name, amen. We're dealing now, you'll remember, in the, with the sixth chapter of the Westminster Confession of Faith entitled, Of the Fall of Man, of Sin, and the Punishment Thereof. We come now to the fifth section. This corruption of nature during this life doth remain in those that are regenerated. And although it be through Christ pardoned and mortified, yet both itself and all the motions thereof are truly and properly sin. The Westminster Confession hasn't yet talked about the mediator and the great redemption from sin, but of course you know about it and the Westminster divines knew about it and they thought about it when they were talking about the fall. And they're reminding us here by way of anticipation that even when we are redeemed, this original corruption still exerts its tremendous power over us and that this sin which still remains even though it doesn't rain after regeneration, is still sin. Some people wonder whether they ought to pray the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors once we have been forgiven. Well, the answer is given here. They are sins. And we have to ask God to forgive us, even though He's simply applying to us the infinite mercies of Christ which were vouchsafed us in the covenant of grace. And that's what the confession is reminding us of at this particular point. The final section, the fall of man, is every sin, both original and actual, being a transgression of the righteous law of God and contrary thereunto, doth in its own nature bring guilt upon the sinner, whereby he is bound over to the wrath of God and curse of the law, and so made subject to death with all miseries spiritual, temporal, and eternal. That's the final dirge about the fall of man. When in Adam we all sinned, we became liable to all these miseries of this life, spiritual and bodily, and of our eternal existence as well. There was an infinite guilt incurred and something approaching infinite punishment which will follow. W.G.T. Shedd, that great reformed theologian of the turn of the century, once said, the most important conviction a man can have is the conviction of sin. I think the Westminster people would have agreed with him. If we are convicted of our sins and our sin from which the sins come, then we realize that we are fit only for destruction. And that there's only one way possible for our salvation. This was undoubtedly in the minds of the Westminster divines when they wrote this last part of the fall of man because it leads naturally into chapter 7 where we begin the study of redemption with God's covenant with man. The first section of chapter 7 reads this way. And I may say even before I read it, as we take up this discussion of the covenant as given to us by the Westminster Confession of Faith in 1647, that this is one of the distinctive features of the Westminster Creed, the covenant of grace. It was present in Calvin, it was present in Augustine in a more primordial form, but the covenant never became the center of theological orientation and systematic structure until the period following the Reformation. At the same time that this particular creed and this article on the covenant were being written, Coxeus, and a major Dutch theologian, was writing a definitive work on that subject. Some of the Reformed people in the Rhine Valley in the earlier century had thought along those lines, but it's really not the 17th, until the 17th century that we get Reformed theology subsumed under the heading of the covenant. 
and what you call to this day covenant theology. So this chapter which we read is not only a very significant exposition of Holy Scripture on this subject, but it's historically a turning point in the way in which Reformed theology was, as we, as we say, done or constructed. Number one says, the distance between God and the creature is so great that although reasonable creatures do owe obedience unto him as their creator, yet they could never have any fruition of him as their blessedness and reward, but by some voluntary condescension on God's part, which he hath been pleased to express by way of covenant. You see what our fathers are saying in that regard is that God is so high above us, so far beyond us, so infinitely transcending us, that we, as the creatures of the dust, could never possibly do anything that would in any way deserve even his attention, not to mention concern. Because there is that infinite gap, as it were, between God and man, in the very nature of the two beings, the covenant is conceived of as a mighty act of condescension on God's part. It's an infinite stoop of the divine being to condescend to a level where he deals meaningfully with creatures infinitely beneath him. They're not equal and the Westminster Divines never forget that this is an infinite condescension on God's part. But nevertheless, since God could have no fruition of mere finite creatures, as the confession puts it, he does condescend so that actually he can enter into a relationship to them, even though they are reminded at the outset that he utterly transcends them. I mention that because most people who are uncomfortable with the covenant idea are so because they think it somehow or other levels God and man. You know, the way we use the term covenant or partnership or something, it is between equals. A man and a woman make a, a marriage covenant, you see. And they're both human beings. They're both equal. And they both have rights and such things as that. And two people enter into a business partnership. And likewise, one contributes this and another contributes that. There's a kind of equality, a leveling and a contribution by both parties, equal parties, as we would say. Well, it, some people feel that when you use the word covenant with respect to God and man, it just doesn't fit because it suggests you're lowering God to the level of man. And of course, if we were doing that, then of course, that would be blasphemy. But the first thing I remind you of is that word covenant. Bereath is in the Old Testament. Diakonia in the New Testament is also a biblical term. The concept of covenant, in other words, comes from God's word and not man's word here. So you can be perfectly sure God would look out for his own interest and see to it that any kind of a covenant which he established with his creatures would in no way level him with the creatures. It's condescension so that he can show a concern for them and receive their doings in some sort of relationship to him even while they are reminded of the fact that he is infinitely beyond them. So in a sentence, let's put it this way. The word covenant, the biblical concept, is very, very valuable because it talks about the way God does deal with men, and it is not to be confused with any kind of equalization of God with men. Section 2 says, The first covenant made with man was a covenant of works wherein life was promised to Adam and in him to his posterity upon condition of perfect and personal obedience. This is the famous covenant of works. Now you see immediately the infinite condescension in that. And anybody who had the notion that covenants suggested equality would have his mind disabused of any such notion immediately. Because how? Could Adam's obedience possibly deserve eternal life? 
How could Adams, doing what he, as a creature, was told to do and happy in doing, possibly pay in full, as it were, for eternal life? It's a covenant of works, but not in the sense that these works could really merit the covenant. They're works. You see, that's what throws us off. And we fall into the pit of supposing that because they're our works, Adam's works, they therefore earned it. No, no, no. God established this covenant with Adam that if he did such and such, which wasn't worth even a thank you, Adam should have said, if he did everything that he was required, I am an unprofitable servant. I have only done what is my duty to do, but nevertheless, God said, when you do what is your duty to do, I am going to give you and all of your posterity eternal life. But you see, it's related, this covenant is related to man's works. And while it's gracious in its core, most people seem to miss this, and I wish the Westminster Divines had stressed it more, and had they lived in the subsequent 300 years, they would have, just to head off people's misunderstanding, which I suppose they didn't anticipate so much and so on, they would have pointed out that even the covenant of works was a gracious covenant indeed and an instance of infinite condescension and not equalization on God's part. Section 3, man by his fall, having made himself incapable of life by that covenant, that is a covenant of works, the Lord was pleased to make a second, commonly called the covenant of grace, wherein he freely offereth unto sinners life and salvation by Jesus Christ. See, by what Christ does, not by what they did. Requiring of them faith in him that they may be saved. See, trust in him and somebody else, not in themselves and what they did, even though what they did would never have deserved eternal life. That they may be saved, and promising to give unto all those that are ordained unto life His Holy Spirit, to make them willing and able to believe. Now you see the difference between the covenant of works and the covenant of grace. And as I indicated a moment ago, the covenant of works itself was gracious. This is part of the reason our fathers here mention the fact that uh, they use a language that's almost, in, uh, uses the language so-called, you see. That is, this language itself is dangerous, you see, because it suggests that there's grace here but none there, and that this is a matter of human works and this is a matter of divine work of Jesus Christ in the human nature. But you see, these human works of Adam do not deserve eternal life. You must never get that impression. This is essentially a difference of degree rather than kind. But nevertheless, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. Adam could have said something I, in my hands I bring, something which by no means would deserve eternal life. But nevertheless, something. I was obedient to the commandments. I did not disobey what you required me to shun. I did do what you required me to do. It didn't deserve eternal life, but you can't say nothing in my hands I bring. But with respect to the covenant of grace, it's pure grace. Nothing in my hands I bring. All I do is put my trust in another person, Jesus Christ, who paid it all. Jesus paid it all. He did it entirely. I did absolutely nothing except receive what he himself did do. That's the nature of the covenant of grace. It is pure grace. This is mini grace. This is maxi grace, <coughs> if I may put it that way. And notice here, too, another thing that worries people about the covenant is that they think it implies that the human partner is able to make a contribution to it and thereby denies the graciousness of it. Now, it is perfectly true, as the confession says, the human person who enters into the covenant of grace does something, but he doesn't do anything. He receives something. And it goes a step further and points out that God gives him the desire to receive it. It's not only that he doesn't have anything in his hands, but even the act of faith in the Christ who has everything in his hands 
was supplied by the God of grace himself. Not only provided, in other words, but also supplied, it's indicating uh, here. Number four continues, this covenant of grace is frequently set forth in the scripture by the name of a testament in reference to the death of Jesus Christ, the testator, and to the everlasting inheritance which all things belonging to it therein bequeathed. These two are synonyms, you see. The covenant idea has as a synonym the testament idea. After all, a covenant is just an agreement. The word testament indicates the kind of agreement. God agreed to give his own son who agreed to be delivered up for our offenses and raised again for our justification. And his death is what secured our life and his death is the testament which he wills to us. You see, so it's just, it's not other than the covenant, it's just an explaining what the covenant is. There are synonyms in which the one term covenant indicates the general relationship, testament indicates the kind of covenant that it actually is, namely a testament bequeathed in the blood of the dying Savior. Section 5 says this covenant it's a very important section dealing with modern dispensationalism and showing that in 1647, the Westminster divines were categorically opposed to anything suggesting what we call today dispensationalism. This covenant was differently administered in the time of the law and in the time of the gospel. Under the law, it was administered by promises, prophecies, sacrifices, circumcision, the paschal lamb, and other types and ordinances delivered to the people of the Jews, all four signifying Christ to come, which were for that time sufficient and efficacious through the operation of the Spirit capital S, Holy Spirit, to instruct and build up the elect in faith in the promised Messiah, by whom they had full remission of sins and eternal salvation, and is called the Old Testament. They're laboring the fact, you see, that the church in the Jewish dispensation was a church of the testament of Jesus Christ. It was in the covenant of grace. The covenant of grace was administered differently in the Old Testament than it is administered in the New Testament, but it's the same covenant of grace in the Old Testament and all of the ages of the Old Testament as in the New Testament, all the ages of human time. The covenant of grace is the only way of salvation anybody from Adam to the last of the redeemed has ever or ever shall be saved is what our fathers are saying. The Old Testament, in other words, was the covenant of grace in a legal dispensation. It was not a legal dispensation. It was not a legal covenant. It never did teach this do and thou shalt live in the sense of do this and you will earn eternal life as if it were a reenactment of the covenant of works. When Adam disobeyed the covenant of works, it was gone forever. And that this do and thou shalt live in the Old Testament means do this and you are in the way of salvation, not that you are securing your salvation. No, no, it's the covenant of grace alone which does that, but in the Old Testament the covenant of grace is administered with sacrifices and prophecies and so on in that familiar way of the legal dispensation. That's the only difference, a difference of mode rather than essence. If the dispensationalists would say nothing more than that, we'd have no problem, but because they think this is an entirely different, essential way of proceeding on the part of God and man, I mean, a serious uh, defection from Scripture and the Westminster Confession of Faith at this point, the chapter on the, on the covenant concludes with section 6. Under the gospel, when Christ the substance was exhibited, the ordinances in which this covenant is dispensed are the preaching of the word, the administration of the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper, which though fewer in number and administered with more simplicity and less outward glory, yet in them it is held forth in more fullness, evidence, and spiritual efficacy to all nations, both Jews and Gentiles, and is called the New Testament. 
There are not, therefore, two covenants of grace differing in substance, but one and the same under various dispensations. I don't think I need to add anything to what I've already said about it. The covenant theology has made it very clear that this is the way God has chosen to deal with mankind salvifically. In the original gracious covenant of works, man sinned, broke the covenant, and brought judgment upon all whom he represented. In the covenant of grace, the second Adam, Jesus Christ, fulfilled all the requirements for his people and purchased redemption for them and brought them to the covenant by his Holy Spirit working in them. We come now to the one who's the hero of it all, to the one on whom the covenant rests, the one in whom election terminated, the one who is the Alpha and the Omega of our salvation, Jesus Christ. And chapter, 28, chapter 8 deals with, of Christ the Mediator. Section 1, it pleased God in his eternal purpose to choose and ordain the Lord Jesus, his only begotten Son. Remember, he's already been indicated as a member of the Trinity, the eternal God, to be the mediator between God and man. The prophet, priest, and king, the one who sets forth, the one who intercedes for, and the one who rules his people. The head and savior of his church, the heir of all things, and judge of the world, unto whom he did from all eternity give a people to be his seed, and to be by him in time redeemed, called, justified, sanctified, and glorified. In other words, this first section is telling us that in the carrying out of the divine decree, God established a covenant of grace, and the person with whom he established it was none other than his eternally begotten Son who voluntarily entered into that agreement to die for the remission of his sins of his people and to bring them savingly home to him and that their entire deliverance and sanctification and glorification would be an accomplishment of Christ the Mediator interceding for them and securing their deliverance from the fall and their title to everlasting life. Section 2 says, The Son of God, the second person in the Trinity, being very and eternal God of one substance and equal with the Father, did, when the fullness of time was come, take upon him man's nature with all the essential properties, essential properties, and common infirmities, not sins, but common weaknesses thereof, yet without sin, being conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost in the womb of the Virgin Mary, of her substance, so that two whole, perfect, and distinct natures the Godhead and the manhood were inseparably joined together in one person without conversion, composition, or confusion, which person is very God and very man, yet one Christ, the only mediator between God and man. Now, this is another one of those statements about the person of Christ. I, I defy anybody to improve. I don't know how you could... Uh, add any excellence to what's already said there. The magnificent indication of the fact that Jesus Christ who became man is fully and thoroughly and equally God. And with just as clear an articulation, it makes it certain to us that he is utterly man. The very substance of man. Everything that belongs to mankind, namely his rational nature, his moral nature, his bodily nature. Sin does not belong to human nature. We incurred it by the fall. It's inalienable except through the mediation of Jesus Christ, but it doesn't belong to human nature. That's the reason sinners will be ultimately destroyed. They're not fit for the purpose for which they're made. They're fit, as Romans 9 would say, only for destruction. Now, Christ didn't take a nature which was fit only for destruction. He didn't take a nature which had sin. He took a nature which was able to bear the consequences of sin vicariously as a substitute. And because he was God, 
That death which he underwent because he was man is of infinite value and can be, as is indicated here, the basis of our eternal salvation. Number three says the Lord Jesus in his human nature, thus united to the divine, was sanctified and anointed with the Holy Spirit above measure, having in him all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge in whom it pleased the Father that all fullness should dwell to the end that being holy, harmless, undefiled, and full of grace and truth, he might be thoroughly furnished to execute the office of a mediator and surety which office he took not unto himself, but thereunto was called by his Father, who put all power and judgment into his hand and gave him commandment to execute the same. I find it a rather wonderful thing the way the confession can say in one breath that this Son of God is the eternal Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, absolutely equal with the Father, and then in the next section, just as thoroughly, in an unhindered fashion, with thoroughgoing uh, uh, utterance, say that he was subordinate to the Father, he was commissioned by the Father, he was given this power and that power and that duty and the other duty by the Father. You see, it takes his deity with absolute seriousness and his humanity with equal seriousness and everything that pertains to human nature Jesus Christ underwent as a virtuous human being and was totally obedient to anything which the Father commanded, just as if he were not God. As God, he was one with the Father and in no way subordinate to him and no way obedient to him, absolutely as equal. But when he took upon himself a human nature, agreed to do so and did do so in time, he obeyed utterly, just as if he were man and nothing but man. As a matter of fact, liberalism falls into the pit of supposing that Jesus Christ is merely a man because he said, I came to do my Father's will, and the Father is greater than I, and why callest thou me good, none is good, save God? Christ is talking as a man, and as a man he's infinitely below the deity and acts accordingly and carries out his duty accordingly. And as I say, if you don't watch yourself, you'd fall into the liberal pit and supposing that he is nothing but a man. H.G. Wells did that, wrote an interesting essay, Pure Heresy, entitled Man Among Men. Absolutely right. Jesus Christ was a man among men. But he happened to be the God-man among men. But just as Wells couldn't get it through his head that he could be man and God, Emmanuel, the fullness of the Godhead dwelling bodily, so many people today cannot. But the Westminster Confession makes it perfectly clear that this one who became God eternally is and ever remains God. And so is the God-man. But with full recognition of thorough incarnation on his part. Section 4 reads, This office the Lord Jesus did most willingly undertake, which that he might discharge, he was made under the law. Willingly undertake, you see, see, because he'd been asked to do it and he was a subservient child and so on. And did perfectly fulfill it. Endured most grievous torments immediately in his soul and most painful sufferings in his body. Was crucified and died. Was buried and remained under the power of death, yet saw no corruption. On the third day he arose from the dead with the same body in which he suffered, with which also he ascended into heaven. And there sitteth at the right hand of his Father, making intercession, and shall return to judge men and angels at the end of the world. You see, he's man through life. He's man in resurrection. He's man in ascension. He is man at the right hand of God in his session right now. He's coming again as man in the clouds of glory and every eye shall see him. That man is none other than very God of very God. There's some more wonderful things to say about Christ the mediator and we'll take them up when we conclude this great section, chapter 8, in our next lesson.